Hello, everyone. I'm Dominique. And I'm Christina. And we are the Connected in Glass podcast. Every week, we will feature interviews with glass artists who speak to their creative processes and overcoming challenges. These conversations are real and raw. We hope that by sharing these stories, you're able to find some connection and know that you're not alone. If you love this podcast and want to help support its creation, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash connected in glass. Also, please consider joining our Facebook group, Connected in Glass Podcast, where you can continue following the artists that we've interviewed in previous episodes. Today, we're interviewing Janice Miltenberger. Janice is a glass artist originally from Berkeley, California. She started working in glass around 1978 and works in both furnace glass and on the torch. Hi. Hey. Thanks so much for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. All right, so we're just going to jump right in. At first, we like to know a little bit about you besides glass. So I know that you've been doing glass for quite some time, but maybe you could tell us where you live, what you enjoy besides glass, and then kind of work into the story of how glass came into your life. Uh, well, I can tell you what I'm into now, uh, which is... and it's been true for probably the last 30 years is I really like to garden. I like growing my own vegetables. Um, I do, my husband has a restaurant and in the summer I try to supply him with, you know, I live in Northwest Washington. So I live on this little Island and uh, good tomatoes and other like hot, growing crops such as eggplants and basil and things like that are, you know, you never really get good ones unless you grow them yourself. So I have a 30 by 15 foot hoop house and I grow probably between 30 and 50 tomato tomato plants a year, which I um, prune to kind of grow up these twines so that they're vertical rather than laying on the ground. And then I also grow eggplant and basil and sometimes decorative herbs like shiso or something that he might use to garnish his meals. And I love doing that. I really love gardening. I also love hiking and uh, hanging out with my friends, just my really close friends. And uh, I also work in EMS. I'm a volunteer EMT. And I've done that for the past nine years. And um, I live in a small community. And we have 17 volunteer EMTs and three three medics, plus a whole volunteer fire force. And um, that is really the core of my interest. I really am interested in working with the people that I work with through EMS and helping my community because most of the people that we see on aid calls are people we know, at least one person on our team knows the individual. Um, in the summer, we have, of course, a lot of tourists on the island. And so we we don't know those folks, but we're really, it's a really tight group and we do a lot of training and it really keeps me always learning and changing. And I think probably what's really been interesting is how my two interests of gardening and EMS have married into the glass that I make and my imagery and the narrative of what I do. And so I'm, I'm really content with my activities outside of glass. <laughs> glass work makes so much more sense now. Just understanding that background, it's so cool. Yeah. Can you kind of describe how you incorporate gardening and um, EMT into your work for people that haven't seen your work? Right. Well, my work, if you were to look at my work, it's very um, botanical looking. Um, And I think that really lends itself to the technique of 
lamp working because unlike glass blowing where you're really working with a lot of solid shapes where you're blowing you're blowing shapes that then give you a lot of surface area and you're or maybe casting um, with lamp working, you're working with rods and tubing. And so it's much more like lattice work or say working with um, welding. And so it, it just already likens itself to plant material, right? Though you can um, gather up balls of glass in lamp working and flatten them and shape them and blow them. Um, it's a, unless you have a lot of different equipment like a lathe or whatever, you cannot get the large scale, um, like blown areas that you would out of the furnace. And so I create those larger pieces by doing more of a lattice work of working with rods. And, um, and because I already had, my father was a um, landscaper so I already had this background of being around and I had a lot of appreciation for the natural world. And so when I started working with the torch, it really lent itself to exploring that. And, and that's what I did. Um, the EMS work, how that kind of played in is that EMS is one of those places where you're called in and you arrive in somebody's world at the worst time of their life, right? And so it's very intense. And those kind of narratives and how you can be touched and touch others are really what kind of drive my inner self and how EMS and glass and uh, the natural world kind of comes together is that, of course, a lot of the nat a lot of the natural world has been used for healing, right? Throughout the centuries, throughout ages and ages, pe people have always looked around them, and so um, those a lot of the plants directly relate to the body, and so it's those stories that I've kind of drawn from. And that's what's created, you know, my interest in my work. That is so cool. <laughs> I think it's, um, I think the natural thing that people do, which is draw from their passions, really. Um, because that's what really sustains you with art, because art can be very unforgiving in terms of payback. And so... You always, I, uh, early on, I had a mentor who was a ceramic artist, just a local gal. And um, she, she always emphasized to me, it's not the finished product, it's the process. Because the process is where you're spending your time and you want to make sure that that process is really giving back to you. And so my own storytelling and my world being able to integrate into what I do on almost a daily basis is really vital, I think, for me. Can you tell us the story about how you got into glass? Start at the beginning. Oh, sure. That's a well-worn story. <laughs> um, well, so I was out of high school and I was going to Laney Community College, which is in Oakland. And um, in high school, I pretty much lived when I wasn't doing, I was really into uh, physical education. I did a lot. I, I had a huge high school and this was, you know, in the seventies. And um, we had at our high school, we had Israeli folk dance, fencing, um, all kinds of dance, like modern dance, jazz dance, dance through the ages gymnastics, we had every sport, you know, and so I really got into doing those things. And um, those really drove me and then also doing art and they had a ceramics room. And I lived in that ceramics room, I really loved it in there. And so after 
high school, I decided to go to a community college that had a good ceramics program, which was in Oakland. And it had two professors, one of whom was uh, Nancy Sullivan, who's still a friend today. And she did really beautiful uh, low fire ceramics work and I was doing low fire work as well. And one day I went into the ceramics office and I was kind of, you know, hanging out, talking to her, paging around. And I came up upon this magazine, Art in America. And there on the cover was this incredible Marini uh, glass ornament, a Christmas ornament. And it was sold to the Mond uh, it was um, it was on the Mondale family's Christmas tree that year. This is how back, far back we're going. And um, I said, oh my God, I said to Nancy, oh my God, who, I would do anything to learn how to do this. And she said, oh, I share a studio with that artist and I've known him since college. I'll talk to him and see if he needs an apprentice. And uh, that artist was Richard Marquis. And um, he was starting a new, new studio in Oakland and he hired on, um, two glass blow, other glass blowers, one of whom was um, Jack Wax, and then Jody Fine was the other, and they were apprentices as well, but they got paid. I was what they called the lizard's lizard, you know, I was kind of the bottom of the heap. I had no glass experience, and so I came in just doing whatever I was told and everything I had to just learn, and um, Soon after that, I was, we worked there for about a year and then he moved his studio from Oakland into Berkeley. And so I worked not full-time, but close to full-time. And then slowly, uh, as I learned more skills, he paid me. And, um, and then at about two years into that apprenticeship, I started going to uh, CCAC and I studied with Marvin Lepofsky there. And so that's, kind of how, how it all began. That's such a good story. Oh. <laughs> it is. I mean, it was really affirming I, and it's just so funny how sometimes things fall into place. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you learned lamp working later. How did you mm -hmm. get to become a lamp worker? Um, when I was studying at uh, CCAC, which is now called CCA. Um, Marvin brought in Johnny Toso and Johnny um, did a little lamp working demo just using a, like a welding torch. And, um, and of course, as a kid back then, you know, you would see at carnivals or something, you would see lamp workers, right? Making little glass animals. And I, I was always fascinated by that. And so I always had it in my head, gee, if there was ever a time that I could study doing that, I would love to do that. And um, I moved to the Northwest. And, and so one, uh, for a few years, Pilchuck was starting to have lamp workers come in and teach. And the first year I studied, I got um, a partial scholarship and I studied with Susan Plum at Pilchuck because I live maybe only about an hour away from Pilchuck. And so um, I was there for two weeks or two and a half weeks. And then the next summer, I, and I had access to some laboratory torches um, kind of through a different connection. And so then throughout that next year, after taking that class, um, I worked on my own using the torch and then went back the next year also with a partial scholarship and I studied with James Minson who was at the time he was uh, Jenny Ruffner's um, gaffer pretty much in the Lampwork studio and then the last year I went to Pilchuck was the year after that and I studied with Cesare Tofolo and it was really Cesare. I mean, I, I got something different from all those instructors, but Cesare, I think because um, in Murano it was very common that they, the lamp workers used hot glass tools. 
And that, of course, that was my background was hot glass. And so um, when I realized I didn't have to like uh, you get used to using graphite things to manipulate the glass when I could use jacks and diamond shears and regular shears for cutting and, and molds even to blow into that I, it really opened it up for me. It was suddenly I had this com comfort level that I didn't have before. And, and those were the only classes I've ever taken in lamp working. Um, so that was such a good story and I'm really excited to hear it. That was so cool. Um, can you tell us more about like your work that you do now? Do you have a, a workspace at home? Not at home. I have, um, years ago when I met my husband, who is an artist at the time, we um, had studio spaces next to each other. And then that building was going to be sold. So we looked to find another space. And um, there was really nothing available. So uh, we ended up being offered at a low cost some lots, empty lots that were not too far from where we lived. And so we ended up building um, our commercial building, which became um, kind of the storefront of the building is now my husband's restaurant because he changed from doing, well, from doing practically everything in his lifetime, but from being an artist into um, running a restaurant and a wine store. And then um, he had a studio space that was upstairs in the building. And now we're changing that into um, a living area for my older daughter um, who works remotely from there. And my space is kind of in the back of the building on the bottom floor. And it's about 400 square feet, it's small. And I have my own set of concentrators and so I don't have to and leave the island and get oxygen anymore, which has been a real, um, as we've gotten older, my husband was like, you've got to do this because <laughs> we are not going to move those bottles forever. And I was like, it's our workout. We can do it. Uh, <laughs> but dragging them through gravel, that was really hard, you know, the large size K tanks. And I have a huge sandblaster in my studio. It's uh, the inside diameter is four by five feet. It's really large. And um, my compressor and um, dust collector are out in a, sh a separate shed outside so that the noise isn't too loud. That's also where my, um, in another separate shed is where I keep the um, my oxygen concentrators and the compression system that delivers that to me. So right now I'm only purchasing um, the electricity and then the propane. And then uh, back when Trump got put into office, um, my husband said, screw this, we're gonna put a whole solar array on our building. And so we, um, we had a company install 31 panels. So now, my studio is basically, um, I'm at like the zero gain where we get paid now for our electricity use. And so I feel pretty good about what we're doing. I mean, you know, considering. That's so cool. You have a nice setup. Do you <laughs> typically just work alone? I do just work alone. Um, I really... I had, uh, I had hired, my older daughter um, had a classmate who I've known since she was, you know, a little kid, Lane. And Lane did work for me for a while, painting my work, she, really talented woman. And Lane and I were both like, let's just text and never really talk together because, <laughs> because we were both such solitary individuals. And I mean, I can be social, but I also really, um, I like being in my studio without any interruptions unless I want them to happen. So, yeah. 
I work alone. And I was, I was just wondering how you met your husband and if he has anything to do with glass. He has nothing to do with glass. Um, but we have done some collaborations where he will, um, well, I'll go into that in a minute. Um, I met him at a arts and crafts fair that we both did. And we became, he was living in the Bay Area where I'm from. And um, so it was after about six months of dating. This is just when we were writing letters and calling each other pre-email that uh, he took a chance and moved up. I had two small children and he just, he moved in with us and it was really a, a big leap of faith for him, but it worked out. We've been married now over 25 years. So that's been good. Um, and he was a printmaker and a painter when I met him. Uh, he did great work real, that really inspired me. And um, so I stole a lot of his ideas. And, and I did for a while, very kind of character type pieces um, that directly related to what he was drawing and, um, and printing. And then a couple of years ago, I've taught, uh, I had the opportunity to teach twice at, in Nijima in Japan. And um, Bruce has come with me each time. I mean, it's a great opportunity if anyone gets a chance to go there. It's a beautiful island outside of Tokyo. And the last time we were there, um, we decided to put a piece up for auction. And so what Bruce did was he made a, a drawing and, and, um, and then, you know, painted it. And then I made a, a glass piece to the drawing. And then I, and he painted my piece and then it all went up for auction at the end. And it was so much fun that we decided we wanted to do a whole show of work where we went kind of back and forth where I would make something, he would do a drawing about it or he would do a drawing and then I would make something that related directly to his drawing. He's very creative um, emotional person. I have a lot of, I admire him a lot. Yeah. It's been a good match. That's so sweet to hear. Um, can you kind of describe your creative process and maybe how it differs when it's just your creative process versus when the two of you collaborate? Oh, sure. Yeah. We don't collaborate all that much. Um, I think it's different depending on the inspiration, um, I can say that I've been inspired by reading phrases um, and it will immediately give me a, an image or an idea just from reading a phrase. And I will make a piece based upon that experience of reading a phrase. And I've had other inspirations from, um, like as a child, I made a piece uh, just a few years ago, a large, it was a large swing set. And um, I mean, a full size children's swing set. And the framework was aluminum. And then I lamp worked the chains and then cast the seats, um, there were the kind of the regular strap swing seats. And then I made also a toddler seat that's more like a bucket seat. And, um, and this piece was called Constant Companion. And it was based upon this memory that I had as a child of swinging and feeling like sadness was swinging with me like I had a presence of sadness and and so when I finally made the piece I did some kind of sleuthing and realized that also the movement of swinging 
has a certain effect on the body and it does, um, I mean, I don't have the information in front of me now, but it had a, a specific effect on the mind and lulling, which is not at all unusual when you think that babies get rocked. And, um, and so for me, um, it ended up, I was drawing from lots of different sources for the inspiration. It was this idea that actually biologically, the act of swinging has a certain comfort. And then for me, having that memory of sadness, and I'd written a piece years ago about about that memory that I had. Um, another, another inspiration was um, my father, because my father died when I was 19. And he was an older man when I was born, he was 46. And I didn't know that much about him, really. I mean, you know, you don't really dig into getting to know your parents often till uh, about their own lives, till you're a little bit older, till you can have that separate curiosity. And, um, and so when he died, I went for years really not knowing that much. And then in my late thirties, early forties, I really started researching him and he had, he had, um, he was born in 1912 and he had fought, he had volunteered and fought in the international brigades in Spain against Franco. And that's a very unique thing. Only a little over 2000 Americans snuck into Spain and fought against a fascist government that was happening there. And um, so as I learned more about about him, and I actually found people who knew him from when he was young that were still alive. And um, I did, uh, I made a ladder and it was a ladder of bones. I replicated human bones and then lamp worked them. And then I created a, a five foot ladder out of these bones with a nest on it. And to me, it was symbolic of kind of the unseen experiences and people that come before us and the bones really that we're stepping on to move forward in our world, right? And so that ended up, I and I actually had several pieces that I did about my dad and it's not, I wouldn't say you would look at the piece and say, oh, this is about Janice's father, but ideally you look at it and, you know, you see that there's definitely a story behind it in some frame. Um, another, another experience was, yeah, reading something that then I took and created a whole world around a certain subject matter. So, you know, it draws from different areas. And of course, now I've been really interested in medicine and the human um, kind of drive and curiosity towards healing and uh, sustaining ourselves. And so I've been um, doing a lot of looking into this whole past of how humans discovered plants and the mythology that kind of went around that. So yeah, you can see I draw from a lot of different areas, all pretty personal though, I have to say. You're almost a poet about just describing your work, the words you use and like the, the language, it's so cool to hear. Oh, thank you. I didn't even think of that. My husband's really into poetry. Me, not so much, but. <laughs> mm. But it kind of sounds like word, words trigger you a little bit and then yes. it kind of sets you off into a, a different train of thought. 
It definitely can. Yeah. And it's really interesting, even just studying a word, like I'll do that. I'll, if something really intrigues me, I will sometimes go try to look back onto the root of that word and see how it was developed and how it was used. Um, you know, it's, I think what's, what's interesting is just the process of coming up with an idea and making making that idea and that sometimes the just the act of making can be a real discovery into the into the idea itself so i don't know that i'm really giving a clear picture about that but every now and again i will work on something and when i start putting it together, there's a, an aspect of the construction of it, which also reflects into the idea of it. And um, I, I see this in other, in other art forms too, where process actually informs the piece itself. Um, like sometimes I've tried to think about how does a bird make a nest and what's involved with that. And um, if I make a nest out of glass, can I make it like a bird or do I weave it or what do I do? And what, what does weaving say versus finding something and putting it together. You know, it's a different concept that goes into it. And those things really intrigue me, I think. I have a question about just on um, the practicality side of things. All of your work has so much time and thought and it's on such a large scale that if you're putting it in a gallery somewhere, or putting it for sale, how do you even comprehend putting a price on something that's so near and dear to you and that clearly takes so much time? <laughs> They're usually not near and dear to me. I love making work and it's really important that the work sell so that I can keep making work. I have kept one or two pieces, that's it. Because they have special meaning to me. Um, it's not that I don't like the work, I mean, sometimes I don't like the work. Sometimes I really like the work. I mean, not every piece is going to sing for you. It's just, it's the reality of it. Um, as far as pricing, the work has to sell. It has to sell. Otherwise I can't keep doing it. I mean, I don't wanna keep buying my own damn work, right? So ideally it sells for as much as I can possibly get for it. I mean, that's what makes sense. And it's a constantly um, changing target, right? It's never the same. Galleries are going under, new ways of selling work are being found. Um, you know, when I started working with glass, there was a, heaps of craft galleries. You could make small work really doing production work. And there was a, a big market and the market only grew into the nineties. And then we had glass collectors. And so you could sell big pieces, not just kind of the middle range, right? And, um, and then the, slowly those people have aged out. I think it's, it's really, really changing. I have, for, my, for myself, um, our commercial building, we have some rentals, we have a rental space in it. Initially the, the front space was 
developed and rented by a different person who had the cafe there um, that paid for our building, which then that took a certain financial burden, burden off of us, right? Um, right now we own the building outright. That's been really helpful. And I make small work under a trade name, which I sell. So that's kind of a bread and butter. This is very common for artists that work, craft artists or people, you know, quote unquote, craft artists, however you want to think of glass. Um, and then the larger pieces, I mean, I, I was gonna say, I love doing the larger work, but you know, I really like doing the little work too. Um, because the little work- Can you give us- Yeah. Can you give us examples of what you mean by a little work? Oh, I make, I have an ornament company and I make ornaments. And, you know, I like a lot of people, right? As a kid, you are so, I was super visual and really intrigued with little, you know, little glass animals, little ceramic things, ornaments on the tree. Um, decorative Easter eggs. I mean, all that stuff. It just really, you know, you, you could look at a marble. How did that get in there? You know, it's very engaging. And so it's easy for me to want to make items like that. I don't, I don't really make marbles. I, I have made marbles, but I don't really make marbles. Um, I make little vases. I make goblets. I make glasses functional glasses to use. Um, this year I'm gonna make, I really, really wanna do this. I wanna make like a mantle Christmas winter scene, you know, with like deer and bunnies. And I, it's just, isn't that ridiculous? But I love stuff like that. So I wanna do that. Um, and I also really enjoy following those dreams that I have about the larger work. And I'm working on a commission right now. And, and then after that, the same guy uh, has commissioned me to make a different piece. So that will pay for my lifestyle in the next few months, which is good. Um, and I, a, I am gonna make some jewelry. I never make jewelry. But uh, Lane, my former employee, she's going to do all the silver and gold work on it. And I'm just going to make glass parts. And, um, and I have a little gallery that's upstairs from my studio. And so in the summertime, when we have tourists on the island, that's where I'm going to sell it. I don't plan on um, wholesaling that work. I do wholesale the ornaments, but hopefully that will slowly come to an end. And how do you get in the mindset to work, especially since you do very large scale work versus kind of what we'd call production work? Does that mindset change at all? Hmm. Well, deadlines are good. That always gets me in the mindset to work, you know. The, some slave driver behind me, you know, really uh, forcing me to move forward. Sometimes, sometimes it can be hard, um, and I really will depend on a deadline. Other times, it's you know because I, I'll say that because life, um, in and of itself, provides me a lot of creative stimulation. Right, not just my artwork but doing the EMS, gardening, uh, doing things just at home, creating parts of my house. I find all of that really creative and um, cooking also can be very creative. But um, to get in my studio, um, if I feel a certain block to it, I have a technique, which is I always leave my studio dirty. So like after a big project, I won't clean up. Because I have identified for myself, 
I'll work and work and work very intensively to finish a project for a deadline. And then once that thing is shipped off and I know it got there safely, it's like a huge hole in front of me. Like what the hell is next? Unless I have something like already scheduled. And so um, if I leave the studio dirty, I can at least go in and reclaim the space by um, throwing stuff away, uncluttering, putting things back where they belong. And it's a way I think of owning the space again. And then I will just sit at the torch and just start making stuff. And I never have a problem. Ideas always come right to me. It's, it's never been an issue. Yeah. And when you have those new ideas, do you just jump on the torch and do them? Or do you draw it out, make a little clay model? Um, oh, God, that just reminded me, Christina, that Oh, anyway, that was a whole different thing, which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, it really depends. If it's just a, like a little vase or an ornament or something, I will make it. I will just go in straight and make it. And usually it takes a few times because like, um, because glass is so technical. Um, there's many ways to approach a, a piece. So to make it especially if it's a production item, I want it to be, I want it to be well-made. I want it to look the way that I want it to look, but it also has to be able to be made quickly. Otherwise I'm not gonna make any kind of profit on it. So I will try different techniques to create the image that I'm looking for. If it's a larger piece, I always draw it out and I draw it to scale and that scale drawing, I draw on cardboard and it's my map. I will bend rods, create parts and actually lay it on there to see how it looks. And then it, the, the plan might deviate somewhat from my drawing as I create it. Because like I said before, sometimes in that creative process, I'll see that to do it in a different way actually speaks to the piece itself. Right? Um, but I would say mostly I use the drawing and that draw, it, the drawing is important to me to do to scale because then I'm ordering boxes if the piece is gonna be shipped. I need, I'll adjust things if I'm being really crazy about scale and I can't get boxes to fit. I mean, you know, it's just, you almost have to work backwards in terms of how much you want to spend on shipping and then, you know, march your way back to how big the piece should be. Um, there's so many things that play into, especially the larger work, but I always start with the drawing. Can you talk a little bit about teaching? You said that you traveled pretty far to go teaching and is that a major part of what you do if COVID didn't exist? And maybe a little bit about the mindset you go in as a teacher? Yeah, I, I do teach. I mean, of course that's been really limited this year. Uh, you know, and it's, every group is so different. And peop, what people think they want from a teaching experience is, is so varied. I, I wish I was a better teacher. I really do. I wish I could innately see into each person and give them that next like a little piece of nourishment to move them forward. I think I can do that sometimes, but not all the time. Teaching is a huge challenge, I think, because it's hard to meet everyone and see, really see everyone where they're at, see who they are see what can really inspire them. 
And then some people, you know, um, they will take a class and they're really not available to interact with in some ways because different things come out when people are students. Um, they can be, it, I've seen often we get into certain ruts with what we make and how we make it. And if people come into my class, I don't want them to make just what they already know how to make back in their studios, right? The whole idea is that you're there, but people can be really challenged and they often want to retreat into an area that they feel that they have some proficiency. And I often wish that, that students would risk being more vulnerable in class and really try something. And every now and again, it happens. And I've seen people who make small things take the leap into really making something three-dimensional, a larger thing. I mean, not huge. I'm not talking something huge. I'm just talking about something that you don't just sit and make an object like uh, I'm not saying that this is bad to make a bead or a, a marble. I'm just saying that um, it is you're done in one setting generally, or you know, maybe you're making marini, and of course you're not done in just one, it takes many, but but the object is complete once you have everything into it. And when you make a larger three-dimensional piece it takes looking at it from different ways and um it is a little mind-blowing when you jump to that and i've seen people go oh my god oh i didn't know that like oh i because you're taking it into a different kind of a different realm i don't know does that answer the question that was so uh, it's so good. good. There's just so many facets of your perspective. Okay, one more thing I was interested in, like along the same line, is what kind of mindset do you go into when you're going to do a demonstration for people? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was so funny. You know, uh, well, it depends, really. Um, you know, I. When I do a demo, um, if it's a demo like at a gas conference or something like that, I think those things are the most difficult because you can't gather the crowd around you to really see what you're doing. Even though it's filmed, you, you can't really, you can't really show people anything, I don't think. And, um, I remember the last gas conference I did, I think I made like two things. I made a circle. <laughs> I just made a glass circle, right? Fairly large glass circle. And then um, I made a leaf, I think. And I talked the whole rest of the time. And my old boss, Dick Marquis was there. And he came, this was in Murano. And he came up to me after the demo and he gave me a hug and he said, you made a circle. <laughs> <laughs> like what kind of like how <laughs> what bs is that janice you know <laughs> um i think the last demo i did was in 2019 when i was i went to china and um for the they have a glass festival there and i made a bird and that was i think that was a good demo it was especially good for that audience which is very um, oriented to highly crafted um, objects, small objects. And um, so you have to kind of think about your audience and I think it's, I think what you make is less important than what you can possibly inspire in people. And that's that's, I think, the most important thing for me. 
I have a friend who's kind of a cult music icon, Jonathan Richmond. And Jonathan told me a story once about, um, he got, he was gonna perform I think in BC in Canada and he got a ride, uh, you know, he was like, he was going through the border and then in true Jonathan passion, he was probably catching a bus or something to the venue in Vancouver. But there was um, a famous um, woman singer who actually had a touring bus going through and she, they recognized each other and um, they didn't know each other prior, prior but <clears throat> she gave him a ride into Vancouver and um, he asked her, you know, how do you, what do you, what do you want out of, out of your performances? And she said, you know, I, she plays to really huge crowds. And she said, if I can touch one person, one person in that whole crowd, my job has been done. You know, if I can, and I just, I think about that, how if one person can feel seen or that I can speak to something in that one person, um, that's really a, a small miracle, I think. Thanks so much for sharing. That's so cool. It's a, it's just so cool to hear all the different mindsets that you have, whether you're doing large scale sculpture or you're doing your ornaments or you're teaching, you know, or you're gardening and you have just all these different parts of you and they all come together. Mm -hmm. They are. I think we're all filled with different parts. Hmm. If there was something that you were to tell your younger self, what would it be? Um, I think it would be to, to soften, to be that, um, to soften and every time that I felt an urgency to not to take my time with it, to not be, not have an urgency drive anything that I do. That, especially with my family, I think in particular, people are so special, you know, and you need to, address things not in a big way but in a very soft gentle way I think and I I don't think um I think it's taken me a long time to get there still getting there yeah I think that's a lesson that I could use myself <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, they say, someone said to me, well, you know, with time, all sharp edges get smooth. And I've definitely felt like I've been in a rock tumbler. So, hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any other stories or any other things that you want to share with everyone? You shared so much, so don't feel like you need to. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. I mean, I are you both, um, Dominique, I know you, you work at the furnace, right? Mm -hmm. And Christina, what about you? Um, I work on the torch and in the furnace. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've been a little, um, every now and again, I'm like happily surprised by torch workers and then other times really dismayed by them. And I hope 
that the medium, you know, really becomes more encouraging to people. Um, it can be, yeah, I think there's a lot of harshness that I see happening within the community. And yeah, and I just would like to see it open up more and, and, and be a more generous crowd, I guess. I mean, that's a, a momentary glimpse, you know? Yeah. You could ask me on another day, I'd have a completely different feeling about it, but. Oh, absolutely. Do you think that just kind of comes with the independence with the torch? Because you say flame workers versus furnace workers, maybe because furnace workers have to rely on each other a little bit more. Or it could just be that I'm just so much more removed from furnace workers that I just have a different perspective too. Mm. It's that I'm more engaged with torch, torch workers. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've seen, because I came into torch work kind of before the whole pipe community. And so I've seen a certain evolution happen. And, and some of that's been really great and other aspects of it have been really harsh, I think. Um, I've seen a lot of harshness between torch workers that I just think, is, is that necessary? Why? Why would that be? Um, but you know, we're all in different places and we all get threatened in different ways. And so it makes sense too, because we're young and we're old and everybody's experiencing something different in their life. And so you're gonna get a gambit of what comes out, but I would just like to see people be a little bit more open and friendly, so. That's a beautiful ending. Well, I really thanks for the opportunity. I, you know, for what it's worth, I hope you guys have a, a good audience and can develop this more. So thank you. It's really a passion so project for us. So mm -hmm. it's important to us and it's helping us. So hopefully it helps other people too. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all your time. Yeah, thank sure. you. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Connected in Glass. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information on the artists we interview and for updates on the podcast.